Our next panel is Empowered by Data, Putting the Consumers in Control. So if I could invite all my panelists to, to join me on stage, please, and sit wherever you like. We're very egalitarian. So we started talking a bit about this this morning, obviously, in relation to the AI Act. Data is unignorable. It's everywhere. It's like asking someone to talk about air. You know, it's, it's, it's ethereal. It's so many different types of data. What you do with it, where it can be used, how it can be used is, uh, is one of the big challenges we're all going to try and discuss on this panel. So let me introduce you. Uh, to my right, we have Antonio Biasson, who is from DG Connect in the European Commission from the other institution, um, MEP Mia Petra Kampala Natri, who is Shadow Rapporteur for the Data Act in the ITRA Committee of relevance to this discussion. Uh, Francesco Valgelajang is Policy Analyst at Open Future and has stepped in as his colleague Paul, who has advertised in the brochure, unfortunately tested positive. Uh, reminded that the pandemic isn't quite over yet. Uh, Wolfgang Gerber is Professor of Economics at the Marburg Centre for Institutional Economics at Marburg University. And Daniela Zimmer comes to us from the Arbeitskammer in Austria. So thank you all very much for being here. Um, we say data is the lifeblood of the digital economy. I'll have a big klaxon if anyone else says it's the new oil because we're all sick of hearing that. Um, but how do we ensure consumers can really benefit from all this data? And I mean consumers benefiting, not just being sold things they don't need or don't want um, with all their connected devices. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Antonio, you to start. Is the Data Act the answer? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. It's really a pleasure to be discussing this issue with this very distinguished panel here. Um, the Data Act has been in development for a number of years, and even just uh, the, the, the mere fact that data nowadays is uh, so highly featured in multiple panels really shows that they ha this has become uh, such a prominent issue. The Data Act was uh, formally announced in the European uh, Strategy for Data of 2020, and the major objective there was to ensure that we are, we are able to build a genuine internal market for data and the Data Act in that regard is really a piece of the puzzle to empower consumers. Because when we're looking at what the general objective of the Data Act is in the first place, is that we are essentially aiming at ensuring fairness in the allocation of data value in amongst the uh, actors of the economy. And the, the, the previous panel uh, focused quite a lot on this uh, term fairness and what exactly do we mean by fairness in this context we mean essentially that we have to, we, we have to find the right balance between uh, opening up new channels for data, for the data to flow between s these actors in the economy, empowering consumers and uh, businesses with uh, greater control over their data, but also ensure that we preserve the incentives for the in continued investment in the data generation or, and other data, te data technologies. The Data Act itself, when we're talking about empowering consumers, does so in multiple avenues, but I guess the one that is most uh, relevant to at least open up this uh, panel with is the IoT context, because IoT technology really challenges our presumptions of fairness around uh, such products when we're talking about uh, in the past when you bought a, a fridge, for instance, or a dishwasher or any kind of home appliance, um, well, that was yours to keep, but nowadays, as these products start, start getting this implementa implementation of new technologies, the product itself continues to generate value via its use, and therefore, currently, the, the data economy doesn't really allow for, for um, the data that is currently withheld by the data holder, mo tip most typically the manufacturers, and the users, including consumers, cannot access this data. And that is exactly what the Data Act does. It opens up new channels for the benefit of the users of such products. Speaking about consumers specifically, what will be the impact the, of the Data Act here? Where um, you can envision a situation where um, there will be uh, higher competition between aftermarket service providers. So as a user, I could send uh, 
dictate or uh, order the uh, manufacturer to share that data with a third party so that this third party can provide me with a better service, with personalized medicine, for instance, or any sort of um, product development that will allow really the achievement of the European Green Deal objectives via more uh, predictive maintenance or repair. So really these are just a, to open up the floor uh, to show that indeed the Data Act is a larger piece of the puzzle here when we're talking about empowerment of consumers over their data. Mia Petra, you're also working hard on this. Um, what are you identifying as what might be the wonderful benefits or the shortcomings or changes we need in the Data Act? Well, for the shortcomings and, uh, and amendments, we still have a couple of weeks' time, so I please uh, uh, welcoming ideas that we have to improve. Uh, but I, I know the draft is there already by colleague Pilar de Castillo, so uh, I, I think it is, uh, will be publicly available, if not now, very soon. Uh, but then uh, I see the, a lot of uh, ideas and, and, and benefits for the consumers. First of all, we get more competition when the data is not hold behind the um, surface that it, it is uh, owned by someone else. So the whole logic is very good here, because if you buy an appliant car, uh, washing machine, whatever, uh, it doesn't produce any data if you keep it in the closet and don't switch it on. And as far, only when you start using it, it starts producing data, and then why the user or the SME is uh, taking out, or the enterprise. So the whole idea is that we get the data out and uh, available, and then how to make the rules. So all the lobbyists who say that don't make it available because of this and that, they act against the idea of the getting the data into the use. And I, I don't say it's easy to uh, open the access to data, there is, of course, the security questions, and then there is IP rights, and a lot of things you can imagine. Business secret is the most common word to water down the idea. But then the uh, other option that I also see already uh, since this uh, uh, proposal, that some companies start to think that what is the new idea of creating data? Do I want to uh, equip the user, consumer, or SME by the possibilities that they can by using my equipment, be on the uh, market to get the data into the use. And I'm very happy that with some companies this is happening, that they start themselves thinking of the new business opportunities. And then the consumer may think that, do I buy this equipment that only collects the data on me and my usage? Or do I buy an equipment that I'm aware what my movements or my uh, uh, using of this produces and what I can learn more for my use or then buy again new services when able to having this data out. So I think there is a lot of positive things and possibilities here. What we need is APIs or good interoperability. We need to define well what kind of data is there. And I think some ideas, for example, that the companies should obligate to uh, catalog the data they have. Otherwise, we should be consumers that, by the way, they might have some info on me that I don't even know. So this kind of new thinking could be a, a good way. So that, is, that will be very hard part that what level and how the data should be accessible. Uh, some companies, again, I said on the traffic side, what is uh, easy to think of, that communication is very important. They already have ideas that when they, how to get the data available. I don't know if that is the perfect way because this is the difficulty here is this is horizontal <laughs> legislation. It's very difficult because we can think of the traffic, we can think of the energy, we can think of the home appliances, and they are a little bit different. And that's actually another topic. If something is happening on the I IoT machine, and that's included, but the same thing is happening by mobile uh, phone, and it's not included. So I think on these te technical details, we get some months uh, to spend time with the lawyers and, <laughs> and commissioner representatives, and then we try to steer the political way. 
Well, I think you're identifying something we probably will come on to and whether Internet of Things is really the right way to think about connected devices overall, but that's uh, for discussion later on. Um, Francesco, the same sort of question to you. I mean, wh what's your view in terms of whether consumers are going to really benefit from connected devices with the, with the Data Act? Well, I think that the Data Act provides a partial answer um, to this question. Um, of course, on the one hand, um, it is definitely a welcome development that the Commission opted for a framework based on access rights, which eventually allows consumers to have greater authority and control over the data that they eventually generate in the context of IoT product use. Um, but on the other hand, it still remains to be seen to what extent users are actually going to benefit indirectly from sharing IoT data to third parties. Um, but overall, I will say that we at Open Future are uh, quite optimistic, and that's mainly for, um, for three reasons. Uh, first of all, um, the Data Act, by embracing such an ambitious framework based on uh, access rights, allows for the development of new business models where users are not anymore in a situation of lock-in, which is very different from the current scenario that we're witnessing right now uh, in data markets. Secondly, the fact that users can actually benefit from sharing data to third parties does not simply equate individual benefit to um, monetization, so just selling data to the highest bidder. And finally, the fact that in Article 3 there is an obligation of manufacturers to um, introduce in the market products which must allow users to access the data, I would say it's already um, a net win. That being said, the fact that uh, users are being given more control does not preclude the fact um, of basically um, um, developing situations where there might be unintended uses or unintended consequences stemming from data sharing. And it is very important throughout the legislative discussion that eventually uh, the, um, the safeguards that can protect data, both personal and non-personal, are upheld and even strengthened. Well, let me turn then uh, to the other end of the table here. Uh, Wolfgang, what, what are your uh, the thoughts on, on the Data Act in general, set out your stall and your current thinking? Okay, thank you so much, said I can present a few thoughts. So I have to admit that I'm much more critical about the Data Act, and I uh, um, have also written a paper about this. Uh, you can find this on SSN. Um, and I will summarize a few points. So I think the Commission has correctly identified the main problem. The main problem is that the manufacturers of IoT devices get exclusive de facto control of all the data through their own design of the technical device. This is the starting point, and therefore, to this exclusive control, the other uh, the, the users as well as third party do not get access to these data, and this leads to negative effects on competition, innovation, and consumer choice. The point is, are now the new data access rights and sharing rights really for consumers as a solution for this problem? And as I said, I'm skeptical about this, and I would like to make three points. The first is, uh, on a very fundamental uh, level, the Commission correctly identifies the problem of the exclusive control, but is doing nothing to prevent the emergence of this problem of exclusive control. On the contrary, the Commission accepts that the manufacturers get exclusive control of all the data, and even recommend it as a normal way of governing, of the governance of the IoT devices. The Commission even protects this de facto exclusive control despite its negative effects on competition, innovation, and consumer choice, and does not encourage other data governance solutions. My second point. But then you can say, okay, we have uh, the, um, this contract between manufacturers uh, and data holders on one side and the user on the other side is a famous Article 4.6 where you find um, in the Data Act saying that the data holders can only use the IoT data on the basis of a contract with the users. This seems to give, um, theoretically, the consumers a lot of power about uh, how their data are used. But in, in fact, with regard to B2C situations, different than B2B, we can expect that we have a huge market failure because we run into the same problems that we already have discussed, that there are information and behavioral problems, as in the case of personal data, we also get with respect to these not personal data, with, con with conflicts about this. And the manufacturers can be expected to sell these devices only in combination with buyout contracts 
so that all these rights to use the data will be end up with the manufacturers for the entire lifetime of the IoT device. Therefore, it can be expected that the data holders get a contract which gives them all the rights for using and monetizing the data. The Data Act does not mean nothing for solving this problem. They have, in this contract, you have really freedom of contract. In B2B, you can negotiate this, but uh, this will not work in B2C. Therefore, we'll have a discussion about more consumer protection measures. The DA does not give the consumers granular choice. For example, that only those data are really generated and collected that are necessary for the functionality of this IoT device and not more data. And we should not forget that the IoT devices um, are important surveillance tools. And therefore, it's important what kind of data they are uh, generating. In that respect, this contract gives the consumers de facto no meaningful control over the data. We have a huge problem here and leaves the consumers only with these new user rights. And now the next question is, do the user rights, now the new rights, really work? And this is my last and third point, the most important one. Um, I'm convinced that uh, this new mechanism of data access and sharing rights will be rather weak and ineffective. Um, the consumers rarely can benefit directly from this data. Important is a data sharing mechanism, whether you can share it with other third parties who can provide services from them. This is the main idea of this, what, how the consumers might benefit from these data, that they get additional services, uh, for example, repair, and repair services, maintenance service, or also unlocking data for other, in other sectors. Now, the problem is, um, that there are a lot of hurdles. So if you read the Data Act very closely and you look really what is necessary for that, then you see that there are a lot of hurdles why this might not work very well. The first is that for many repair and maintenance services, the scope of data, it's only raw data, no derived data, no inferred data. These data will not be enough for really providing repair services and maintenance services. There's also no provisions for really ensuring technical interoperability, so for example, you need software, access to software tools. So in that respect, I don't believe that uh, this really helps a lot for repair and maintenance service or for other IoT-related services. Um, and then you have a lot of problems. Um, for many new services, you need access to aggregated data. It's very hard to build up aggregated data sets using this individual data sharing mechanism. Um, and therefore, this is also very uh, unclear whether this will help much. And you have uh, expected very difficult negotiation processes between the data holders and the third parties because they have to conclude a kind of a licensing contract with front conditions and you have trade secret problems with confidentiality, confidentiality agreements uh, and technical protection measures, et cetera, et cetera, which will lead to a large uh, transaction cost. And it's very prone to obstructive behavior of the data holders if they don't want to cooperate. So in that respect, I think this um, mechanism is rather unattractive and ineffective for the third parties and I don't expect that many additional services will be offered and many data are unlocked for, for innovation. And therefore I think the benefits for consumers will be small and therefore there will also not be many incentives for consumers to use these data rights. And I think it will work better than the data portability right of Article 20 GBR, but it might not work perhaps much better than that. And that's a problem. So summarizing this, um, only one uh, small uh, point about an example, because I have worked a lot about connected cars. In the example of connected cars, it's already clear also for the Commission that this is not sufficient, mm -hmm. and therefore they have launched an update of the type approval regulation uh, really for solving this, because it's not solved by the Data Act. Um, summarizing my, my rather negative assessment, the DA, my view, does not solve the consumer empowerment problem and does not really solve the unlocking of data problem and we don't need much additional benefits. I think, and this is a bit provocative, the real winners from the Data Act are the data holders and the manufacturers because their de facto power over the data will only be limited to a small extent by these dual rights, but the Data Act acknowledges their de facto control and legitimizes it, and this is, I think, a very dangerous precedent and might lead to a dangerous path for the future development of the data economy. Thank you so much. Thank you. You've, you've taken apart quite a lot there. We're going to have to come back to it 
point by point. But Daniela, let me first ask you, um, Wolfgang is sceptical, um, how are you feeling about it? <laughs> hmm, I'm too, but let me begin with something positive and first of all, thanks <laughs> for the invitation. There are some nice to have in the data act too. For example, a right of uh, access to IoT data goes beyond the GDPR with its information rights yeah. directly and as a rule um, uh, in, in real time. GDPR is only yeah. private. Um, but GDPR what we are private. missing is a right only. to restrict this uh, access to um, IoT data for the IoT providers. Uh, in other terms, um, hmm. If I'm a, a consumer, I want to decide on myself to whom I uh, give my data and to determine uh, for how long, uh, for what reasons and uh, mm -hmm. most important in uh, what form, pseudonymized, anonymized or personalized. Yeah? And um, in this regard, the Data Act uh, isn't very helpful because he have other objectives. Um, data controllers under the GDPR uh, shall become uh, data owners. Um, they shouldn't sit on their big data but share them with uh, third parties on f fair terms. From a competition point of view, this is a very good idea. But uh, for fundamental rights, it is a quite unfamiliar um, approach. Uh, not to say it doesn't correspond with fundamental uh, rights. Because it's so easy uh, for an IoT provider um, to identify uh, the user directly or uh, indirectly. So both uh, artificial intelligence and IoT um, are, lead, are leading to a paradigm shift yeah? um, in the sense of um, data-driven economy on the one hand and on the other side fundamental rights, data protection, privacy uh, that means uh, first of all uh, limit the access to data using uh, as little data as possible, deleting quickly uh, asking uh, data subjects for their consent and um, accepting their no. Yeah? Um, even the United Nations Human Rights um, Council has published recently a report uh, on um, the right to privacy uh, in the digital uh, age uh, and uh, that hits the point very well. May I quote briefly? People are witnessing how digital tools can turn against them, exposing them to new forms of surveillance, profiling and control. Modern data-driven technologies dramatically shift the balance of power between the monitoring entity and the monitored. So and we have an Article 14 in the Data Act. Yeah? It contains nothing else than a surveillance uh, order. Authorities, public authorities, uh, can grasp at my IoT data in the event uh, of an exceptional need, whatever uh, uh, this is. Yeah? Um, so, uh, this is precisely that kind uh, of function creep the uh, United Nations once again. Um, in their own terms, even where surveillance serves legitimate purposes, the underlying infrastructure can easily be repurposed, often serving purposes for which it was not originally intended. So to your uh, question, no, the Data Act in that uh, form as we know it uh, isn't the complete answer to these problems. Digital sovereignty means, to our mind, um, an obligation for IoT providers to use anonymized data besides um, uh, contractual necessities. Um, then to find a definition when data are trustworthily uh, anonymized. Um, 
it would be fine to introduce a right to be offline, yeah? even if you uh, use smart goods, because um, yeah, it's an expression of data min minimization if you can reduce the data flow, but it's so important in case uh, of energy blackouts or hacking uh, events. Yeah? And last but not least, <laughs> Hacking event, <laughs> perhaps, <laughs> at the moment. An uh, obligation for providers um, to store um, IOD data locally. Mm -hmm. That means decentrally uh, on my gadget, uh, instead of uh, transmitting in it into the cloud or on an external server. So if consumers aren't in control of uh, their data, um, they never be sure that they are used in their best interest, I think. And uh, currently, we see so many examples that IoT providers find thousand and one reasons why it's absolutely necessary to um, store still more and more and more data. Uh, it sounds like this. Thanks to the monitoring function uh, of your vacuum cleaner with its cameras and sensors and internet connection, um, it doesn't trip over things that lying around. Or thanks to the analysis of your communication data, your voice assistant uh, gets better and better to answer your questions. That may be right, but uh, on the other hand, we have to look that our legislation um, isn't additionally, um, have not additionally the spin to undermine our digital sovereignty. Uh, to be short, we find the GDPR contains two unprecise vague uh, provisions, which providers too often interpret uh, in their favor. Yeah? Um, they already benefit more from this uh, general principles than consumers do if they want uh, to store data for other purposes than the original one, or if they want to claim an overriding legitimate interest, and uh, last but not least, uh, if they use the very broad opening clothes for research and um, statistics. So, come to an end, convenience by IoT is fine, but uh, at the moment we are of too often loss, uh, uh, lose control. Yeah. Well, you've touched on a huge <laughs> array of issues there, Daniela. I think the one on um, uh, sort of emergency situations, we'll park that for the moment because we can <laughs> not go into the length and breadth of what those might be in a general sense. But you also talked about uh, the perceived contradiction with data minimization principles, um, as well as questions about what sort of data, if it's mixed up with personal data, um, and Mia Petra, I want to point to you, is, you know, whether this data should be pseudonymized or anonymized, what, what, what way do we look at that there in terms of people's right to know how the data that they've generated is stored? never mind where it's been stored and if they have a right to deletion and so on. Give me your thoughts. I see you writing frantically during all of these, so feel free to react to anything anyone has said. Yes, first to the, refer to the GDPR. Parliament has many times repeated we are not ready to open or touch it. We are ready to keep it as a promise for the privacy and the Data Act. If it, the data you are handling here is mixed data, then we have a rules that it is under the GDPR. And this is not only uh, and, and not mainly not about the, the GDPR covered data, but the industrial data. And when it's industrial data, it has nothing to do with the GDPR. So many problems solved. <laughs> so then uh, le let's, uh, let's have the, the another look. Uh, and then uh, I, I don't know uh, how to relate to the uh, privacy when it's uh, not uh, uh, at all and, and didn't understand the refer to the United Nations uh, privacy and, and uh, people's rights because GDPR is answer for that one. And we will still have the cases and cases where this comes up, but Data Act will not blur that at all, uh, is my, I, my intention also here very much. 
Then, uh, what was not mentioned here, which is very dear to me, it is this exceptional use, what the, the companies are worried, and that's why I want to take it up here. I think the society, we are not building only digital market, but digital society. And in the society, you have some extreme goals like save the democracy, save the uh, globe, uh, energy efficiency goes there, or climate. So these exceptional urgency cases where you can ask companies to give what they know, it's very limited. And I think that is one of the struggles we have to look at. Uh, if companies have the data how to block the COVID and they don't want to give it, it's not fair. And it's the data that is generated by the people of the society too. So yes, I, I wrote the, the data strategy of the European Parliament and we touched that and we got a big majority that it's not a taboo to ask the com uh, companies also the data when it's needed. But it's not also the double that it should be always free and get it with either IP coverage or whatever. So we have to have also tools in this modern society with the modern, when everything is digitalized, everything comes data. So then we need to have tools on that one. So I don't wanna consider that it's a taboo that you may not ask never, only exceptional, when it's already in fire, it's too late. But then really to find the ways and tools, how to compensate, what data, and then also companies not to lose their uh, R&D, what they have been doing. I think, again, we can say that the transport is happening. It's not any more black and white, but people are acting because you cannot drive one car if the other one is not there, or the traffic lights, all the roads don't talk to each other. But on many other sectors, we don't have any uh, examples yet, so that's why it's also the sketching something, something very new. So, but on the, the professor next to here, you started that you are very critical, but I found your comments mostly how to improve it. So it's a <laughs> very good way to say that you are critical, because this way we need to be. So when we ha agree on the analysis, what we try to do, uh, also I've learned in my eight years in the parliament that commission proposal also develops during the, a lot of stakeholders, not only give the comments for the, the first stage, but also now uh, a lot of has happened in, in these months after the uh, February proposal. So, yes, it goes uh, a lot for the co more concrete that people feel it in the, uh, in the uh, beginning, that it is something very unconcrete. But then again, uh, the sectoral legislation is very important, wh how we can develop the, the traffic, how we can take the health, which is already a proposal, and then uh, different sectors, but this horizontal uh, ground needs to be good on these principles that yes, it is safe and it's secure, but also there is a new thinking how to get Europeans on board. I'm, I'm afraid that this uh, size of the companies bothers me, uh, whether you should exempt uh, SMEs, but if you exempt SMEs, they might have a massive or important uh, data sets for them. And again, if the mindset is that so we actually should have the culture, and I don't know how to legislate the culture, <laughs> but then at least to give some tools. So if we say, uh, today we don't have that culture that sharing is caring, and as, as you referred to the oil that we are very sick of, <laughs> let's think about the circular economy. We have this data here, and let's remind us of the uh, ideas that the Commission had that this might have the 2% of the GDPR, uh, GDPR, GDP. the GDP. Uh, so, a little bit uh, different thing. So, then uh, we need that one. And then all those watering down lobbyist ideas, give me something instead that we can look how to really innovate. I know it goes very difficult when I go company by company, but this is really my intention that let's try to open up and, and create a new kind of economical models. We, ha we do have also the Data Governance Act ready, but it's it's very technical, this is more concrete. We have a lot of acts that we could be talking about, but we'll try and limit ourselves to one per panel. Um, Antonio, um, Wolfgang mentioned there that a lot of the... Uh, seems to rest on the contractual agreements. I mean, are we risking having another situation of banner fatigue, like we had with the cookie banners, that we're just going to end up in a similar sort of scenario again? Well, that is definitely not the intention. We, I think all of us in this room are very much aware that uh, this is 
this consent fatigue is definitely a, re a reality, and uh, with the Data Act, we don't want that. So to answer that question specifically regarding um, the contractual agreements between the data holders and the users, we can maybe get a little bit technical and start talking a little bit about what was, the, what was our intention, our design, with specifically Article 3 and Article 4 of the Data Act. Article 3 starts by talking about the uh, design obligation. So 3.1 specifically. We're talking about the fact that products will have to be designed in such a way that the users of these products can access the data in an ease, secure, direct manner. So it really should be on the object itself. 3.2, we're talking about the uh, information obligation or sometimes also called the packaging obligation. So essentially, when this product or before this product is sold, rented or leased, it should come very clearly uh, certain pieces of crucial information for the user of the, protect, of the um, connected object. For instance, we, we, we can think about um, the nature and the volume of data that will be generated. It will have to be also uh, an obligation to clearly identify who the user should contact to get access to their data. So who is the data holder? Um, situations also around how this access to the data sh should be, um, should take place. So really there's multiple uh, pieces of information that have to be given to the user before this object is bought. That is Article 3. When we're looking at Article 4, we're talking in situations where the object itself does not give the possibility for the user to access the data directly. So the, this is a situation where the user has to requests the data holder to access their data. And there's a very important part in Article 4.1 that says that this has to be done in accordance or following a simple user request. So to really be something that doesn't require a contractual agreement per se, unless the data holder has to uh, agree with the user ways to protect the data because it's, for instance, uh, classified as trade secrets. That's under 4.3. And then the 4.6 element that Professor uh, mentioned, which is indeed very important, and that is also uh, a crucial one when we're talking about consumer empowerment, because the data holder has to agree with the user on what data they will be using. So this is kind of, we can think about this as a reflection of the GDPR transparency requirement. We have that for personal data, so we also want that for non-personal data. And hypothetically, perhaps we can even think about, uh, in the future, competition between manufacturers based on the extent to which they reserve the rights to use data themselves. So this is quite, uh, well, a hypothetical scenario, but one that is uh, perhaps quite close to reality in the future, and I think what would be ultimately beneficial for consumers. Uh, Wolfgang, now, in your paper, you had a, a warning sign that, let me get it uh, correctly. By establishing the rights of consumers and device users in general as an exception from the rights of data holders, the Data Act creates a strong presumption that device manufacturers actually have the original right to all data generated by the devices they sell. Is that, am I getting that correctly? Um, so how, how do we fix that? Is this is, is, uh, you know, creating an imbalance, to use the phrase of our very first panel? I mean, I think this is the most fascinating question of the Data Act and the most mysterious one. To put in a, in, in, in plain words, who is the owner of the data? The IoT data. And the funny thing is that, or not the funny, but the interesting thing is that as a, in the recitals of the DA, um, the, data, the commission says very clearly that the data holders and manufacturers and the data holders have no legal right on these IOD data they are collecting. And the Data Act does also not confer any right to them. So in that respect, in the Data Act, only the users get rights on these data. But, and this is the interesting thing, um, the DA gives uh, manufacturers the uh, right to design the IoT device in a way that they can get exclusive control of all the data. And therefore, they have de facto 
an exclusive position on all these data. Yeah? And economically, economically is if someone has exclusive technical control on data, then this is economically the same as if a legislator would give this entity an absolute right that's perfectly enforced without limitations. So in that respect, implicitly, not explicitly, implicitly the Data Act is really creating something like a property-like position of the data holders in an indirect way through allowing this technological protection and, and getting exclusive control. And therefore, they also incentivize the manufacturers to design an IoT devices in that way for capturing as many data as possible because then they have exclusive control and then they can really then also monetize them, license them, and I think it's very problematic that the Data Act in a very indirect way and, and without discussing it, it's nowhere mentioned, uh, is, is creating such a kind of a, of a blank check in my perspective. Yeah? And therefore we should be very cautious about this. So in many cases this might be okay that the manufacturer gets in such a position. But this, this is exactly this position which allows then, I only know this very well from the connected car, that the car manufacturers can get some kind of gatekeeper uh, position in this whole ecosystem of economic driving and can control all secondary markets. That's exactly what then right now is, is, is attempted to solve by the sector regulation and we'll see how well this works. Um, but the starting point is always this, this technological design by the manufacturer and so they are free to do so. And so I think we should be a bit more cautious about this and perhaps question this and perhaps say, okay, we, uh, we are allowing this position, but they should not abuse it for, for, having, for using it in a way which has negative effects on competition and innovation. So this is, and this is not even addressed in the whole discussion and this is my specific point I would like to make. And, and if you think about that, there was always and still is a consensus that we do not want to introduce a property on data, and we are doing this now de facto indirectly, I see a problem here that I, at least we have to discuss this openly. Mm -hmm. Well, let me see, does anyone want to hazard a guess to who owns the data? Daniela, would you like to give me your thoughts on this particular issue? Yes, I think it's important that um, consumer organization make strong intervention in on behalf of this development, because in the past we made a test of computer games and we were uh, astonished that even games we are playing completely alone need uh, a permanently um, internet connection. You know? So you can ask why and what for. Tracking our behavior is not a natural right and has reached some, some kind of unacceptable level, we, we find. So our job is to communicate, don't ask uh, how convenient um, a gadget that device is, but uh, ask also how it affects your uh, privacy. Um, there are some kind uh, of yeah, possibilities to use IoT data um, in the case of energy production. If uh, every one of us has uh, solar panels on its roofs, then it would be very helpful to monitor how uh, many electricity and to uh, what a price I'm producing at this moment. But besides these very special cases, IoT means too often surveillance and manipulation of our behavior and new dependencies, yeah, you have uh, spoken of. Um, interestingly, the Data Act forbids some kind of unfair behavior but only to third parties and not to the data owner himself. 
well, perhaps you, you can give us an answer to that. Today, a, a modern car um, produces 25 gigabytes data per hour. Huh? And there are some kind of uh, helpful use cases to find parking places and to uh, avoid traffic jams. Um, but on the other hand, uh, what uh, about our mobility profiles, our location data, will become a tradable good? Think of the e-privacy directive. There are huge attempts to lower the protection level. Um, and so uh, our task is to, to warn, uh, first of all, uh, against um, that uh, uh, Data Act doesn't distinguish between personal and non-personal uh, data. Um, it's a serious mistake because um, we think that customer data are always, as a rule, uh, personal related, real neutral uh, operational data are very rare, only in the industrial um, surroundings it's uh, thinkable. So, um, the most of data holders are data, oh, yeah, data holders are uh, data controllers in the sense of the GDPR. Yeah? We uh, never have to forget. And last point, we warn um, that the data concentration um, increases uh, in future. The Commission has uh, made a study recently on IoT for consumers. And one of the conclusions uh, was that the three big uh, dominates the access to customer devices and data flow. And the three bigs are Alexa, Siri, and Google uh, Assistant. And um, we have very uh, a worrying uh, dominate gatekeeper role in the sense of the uh, Digital Market uh, Act. And um, probably you have read it, uh, Amazon is planning to uh, acquire iRobot, a company that produces um, smart vacuum cleaners with its cameras and mm, sensors. Um, and Amazon, as a result, don't uh, know only my online purchases and have access to sensitive audio material, uh, but soon, perhaps, uh, knows the size and um, the, uh, of my rooms and my furnitures and, and uh, something like that. So, uh, <laughs> it's so typical, let me quote, how IROT informs consumers at the moment. The data is used to improve your experience and the performance of your robot. So our demand to IoT providers is inform transparently and please only use anonymized data. That would be a huge milestone to force IoT providers to use it in an anonymized uh, form. And the last uh, comment, protect children. Uh, every consumer um, representative knows the uh, case of the doll Kala. Uh, it was classified as uh, a spyware, a spy device by German authorities because um, it was not only speaking with children but was also listening. And the owners uh, of this doll were uh, forced to destroy it. <laughs> but she is not the uh, only one. Mattel. Uh, produces a Barbie doll that's also listening and uh, only to improve communication, of course. So in summary, uh, we have a lot to do to protect privacy and uh, the Data Act would be an open door to realize it. Okay, quite a, a few things there. Um, so before I come to you, Francesco, Antonio, let's, let's dig into a couple of those things that Danielle has raised. First of all, this impression that it's more about B2B rather than B2C. And so this is kind of creating this sense that 
this isn't really a selling point for the public because things like dark patterns projections are only there for third parties, not for the data holders. Um, and then perhaps you could give us a bit more insight into how decisions are made on which products fall under the act and which do not. You know, we, you were mentioning the doll, the Kayla doll we all know about, but smart watches, virtual assistants, these are the things that people feel are watching them or around them or generating data produced by them day to day. So, okay, so pretty big questions there. Um, so let's start for perhaps with the products one. So the, the right way to analyze or to think about how the commission kind of like delineated between the products that are in or out, uh, it's useful to start first with a general principle and then we can look at the exceptions. So the general principle is that all products that are uh, obtaining, collecting or generating data about their use or environment and that this data is transmitted over public networks it are in. Public networks being the Internet of Things. So this includes a vast array of objects from uh, farming equipment to industrial machinery uh, to medical devices uh, to home appliances and consumer goods, of course. Um, so there's really many aspects there that uh, fall in. Now looking at the exceptions, the exceptions would be products whose primary function is the storing or uh, processing of data or the displaying or playing of, of, content, of content. So that uh, usually includes uh, laptops, smartwatches, no, pardon me, laptops, smartphones, um, uh, smart TVs, smart speakers, uh, things that are used to display content. And by, I can explain a little bit more that because sometimes that's, um, that might be a little bit confusing. So one of the main reasons, or the two reasons actually, that the Commission chose to, to delineate it in this perhaps a little bit greyish form is that and when we're talking about, for instance, a laptop or a smartphone, and we are talking about accessing this data, there, are, there is a constellation of actors who have uh, specific rights. So this would be, for instance, the manufacturer of the laptop, the user of the laptop, and then the provider of the software on which or through which digital content would be created. So this would create, uh, or this creates very complex questions around copyright and intellectual property rights that the Commission at this time chose not to address, at least in the Data Act. Um, there are uh, some products that are particularly interesting to also uh, to, to explicitly um, say that they are in scope, such as virtual assistants, and virtual assistants are usually seen as the entry point to other IoT objects. This was part of the IoT sector inquiry done by, done by the Commission, and indeed, um, they sh virtual assistants should be in insofar they are used to um, uh, interact with inter other IoT objects. So that's the, the general picture as to how the uh, Commission sees the product issue. And also extremely important, however, is to underline that according to Article 41 of the proposal, the Commission will review uh, in two years' time if there are other types of or categories of data that should be included in the, in the scope of the Data Act. So, of course, this is, uh, the, this is an extremely dynamic uh, market, so things might change uh, in the near future. That's <laughs> one big question parked, maybe like, then the next one, uh, regarding um, whether the proposal is indeed uh, touching upon B2C and C2B aspects sufficiently. And there I would say that there is a, indeed a strong intention by the Commission to in ensure that consumers uh, do get access to their data. And their data, perhaps I, I should also just uh, say here, the question about data ownership is an extremely interesting one, although I don't think that's the correct lens to look at, look at things. It's more um, what you want to do with the data. I think how you process the data, that's, that's more uh, perhaps useful lens to use. And in that regard, um, when we're talking about releasing or opening up this exclusive right that currently manufacturers have over IoT objects and they ask us, but why do you want to do this? And it's because you, a, a product will not be able to produce valuable data without the user 
and without the product. Therefore, you, they are co-generating data, they are co-generators, which is um, uh, the, 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 yeah, the, the lens, again, to really look at this issue about uh, data. And so, the Data Act, I think, actually addresses a lot of these B2C and C2B questions. B2C by the fact that I, as a consumer, can ask a manufacturer to give me access to my data. C2B because I can provide this data, I can share this data with a third party that will then provide me with better quality services, for instance. And then that's chapter two. And then we cannot also, we can't forget that chapter six, dealing with cloud searchability, also deals with consumers because consumers can be customers of these uh, cloud and edge data processing services. So according to chapter six, I will be able to get better um, conditions to switch from one provider to another. And also the provisions on data interoperability, with it, for instance. Um, an increase in the, auto, in the interoperability standards across the data economy and specifically related, for instance, with the data spaces will be to the benefit of consumers. Also, the consumers, inf the, the, the enforcement tools, such as the possibility to seek um, redress, for instance, via representative actions, that's also possible. The com and the Data Act also builds on the... Um, consumer protection network, and there's also the possibility to, to even um, uh, address or uh, seek uh, claim with uh, competent, competent um, dispute resolution mechanisms that are, are provided for in the, in the Data Act. So there are multiple ways here that the Data Act is indeed helping uh, consumers and specifically on the point that has been raised, uh, not only by Eugen, but also by uh, previous panels related to dark patterns, uh, an extremely important point, and indeed this was mentioned uh, or, and specifically addressed in the relationship between, as you were mentioning, um, the third parties and users. Mm -hmm. We, when we proposed the, 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 the Data Act, we believed that the provisions in Article 3 and 4 were already uh, not only providing for the technical feasibility for the, for the exercise of the user's rights to get access to their data, but also with sufficient safeguards vis-a-vis -vis the relationship of the data holder with the user. However, of course, this is the proposal uh, is now out and in the hands of the co-legislators, and uh, I think it would be uh, perhaps not so wrong to say that this will increasing the protection for consumers re with regards to, to um, uh, dark patterns. We would see it in uh, future uh, proposals. But again, this is with now <laughs> the parliaments now. Well, and let the, me, and because the I know I want to get Francesco in because you mentioned the interoperability element and that's what I, I wanted to talk to you about. We're only going to reap the, the benefits. I mean, we've, we've spent a lot of time focusing on some negatives, but if we want the benefits of the Data Act, all our devices, all our data, all of this has to be interoperable. And at the moment, it's not. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, they're not, but they are becoming uh, slowly uh, interoperable. Um, I would say, at, at the Data Act level, I would say that the, uh, the intention is to really work of the, at the interoperability of the data level. So um, there is no explicit right uh, to make products interoperable in regards to data but the obligations laid out in Article 3, 4, and 5 really provide, um, in our opinion, a framework where users can actually have access to the data in real time. Uh, of course, there is this caveat of re relevant and appropriate, which will need to be uh, made more explicit throughout the, throughout the legislative process, and eventually also ported to other uh, to third parties to develop competing services. So, in a way, there is this ambition to progressively make data interoperability possible, and I think that the Commission here um, somehow uh, tries to unleash the untapped potential from a right to data interoperability under GDPR, which was not, let's say, manifested because of um, various requirements. So there is this ambition to really expand this on the level of IoT protect protected data, and eventually, as users will be able to um, share data more freely and access data to third parties, this will actually create the incentive for manufacturers to develop products which are more open. Okay, you might not say that they are interoperable under the definition, but increasingly uh, interoperable. And we will see in a year time after the application, after the entry into force of the measure, how this will look like in market practice.
Okay. Wolfgang, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I only wanted to, to, um, to add um, regarding dark patterns so in, the, in the latest compromise uh, text of the presidency, I think from September, so it's very close, there is a new uh, now provision uh, that these dark pattern protection should also be in the relationship between data holder and now the user. So in that respect, they have picked this up and it's not only between uh, user and, and third parties. Perhaps another uh, remark. Um, I have not talked about B2G. I think this is very important. So I have really focused only on IoT governance, so on chapter two, basically. And uh, it's very clear that the Data Act uh, offers other advantages, so also about switching of cloud service providers. And, um, and one uh, remark to interoperability. Um, we have to distinguish between interoperability with regard to the data and technical interoperability with regard, for example, software compatibility of, uh, and in the kind of data, the Data Act offers um, here uh, some solutions, but it offers no solutions to technical interoperability. This is more about technical standardization, and this, and this has been done outside or in sectoral regulations. There is one question maybe for the Commission or at least Parliament. I think there is already a consensus on that, that we created the Data Governance Act and there we established a European Data Innovation Board and we paid a lot of effort that the stakeholders are included. And one meaning was that there will not be sectoral uh, interlocked data also later, but the intersectoral, because what is the traffic data uh, isolated from the um, environment or climate data? Uh, and this is forgotten totally from this uh, uh, data act, and I, I think it's reason to put it back mm -hmm. to increase this, uh, go to the direction mentioned here before. Should yeah. I get um, So, the, so, so I, I hope I understand your question correctly. Um, it's not that the European Data Innovation Board has been forgotten, not at all. It's indeed a very important part of the Data Governance Act, and the tasks that are in the Data Governance Act related, related to the, um, for short, EDIB, European Data Innovation Board, um, include, for example, advising, assisting the Commission in developing guidelines for increased uh, interoperability between the common European data spaces. And that's indeed one of the main provisions in the interoperability chapter of the Data Act that we set standards, or standards perhaps is the wrong word, so let, let's say that we set basic rules for the functioning of these um, common European data spaces. And indeed, when these rules, these, this threshold isn't met, then there are mechanisms in the Data Act that also uh, allow for the uh, Commission to require European standardization organizations to develop harmonized standards that can then be uh, developed so that these this threshold is met in order to achieve these larger objectives of ensuring interoperability, not only, of course, in common European data spaces, but really important is this aspect of intersectoral uh, data interoperability. That is uh, really the, 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 the short answer. And I think the, the role of the, of the EDIB um, is still it's still right now kind of being uh, decided. The Commission is working in its uh, establishment of this expert group that will be essentially assisting the Commission in this uh, development of the uh, data economy. And indeed, uh, we want uh, to ensure that there is wide representation from a, an, an, uh, all relevant stakeholders so that we're all moving in tandem to ensure that uh, this interoperability and also the fulfillment of the, um, the building of the single market for data does take place. Okay, now we're technically at the end of our panel and I'm sure people do want coffee, but if there's time for a question or two, please raise your hands if you have one. No. We've solved data, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> no, it's coffee. <laughs> it's coffee time. Okay, well, we will take a short coffee break. Uh, please be back here at a quarter to the hour because we have a bit of a rock star. We have uh, Shoshana Zuboff joining us, and she's joining us remotely. So we'll be starting whether you're back in the room or not. So uh, give a big round of applause to this panel, though, please. Thank you.